<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the official side event of the High Level Political Forum, Recovering Better Global Opportunities for Jumpstarting the Real Economy. Just a short introduction. My name is Jessica Chiam. I'm the founder and managing director of Eco Business. For those of you who have not heard of us, we are Asia Pacific's leading media organization on sustainable development, and we've been covering this topic for more than a decade. I'm delighted to be joining all of you here from Singapore, and I'd like to thank the hosts, SEED and UN Environment Programme for the invitation to moderate this exciting dialogue. I think this conversation cannot be more timely as we reflect on how the international community should best respond to this pandemic, which is the largest peacetime crisis humanity has seen in generations. Even as we grapple with these challenges though, it is now obvious that we cannot return to the way things were pre-COVID-19. We need to, and as the UN eloquently puts it, build back better. The question is though, how are we going to do so? As momentum builds for a post-pandemic recovery, this event will ask the crucial questions. Where can we find inspiration? What are the examples of success? And which solutions can be scaled and replicated to jumpstart green recoveries? So today we will spend the first half of the event looking at understanding the challenges of recovering better, while the second half will be spent looking at how to navigate the green recovery options available. On this note, I'd like to kick off today's proceedings by introducing a video produced by SEED that will provide some food for thought with voices from the front line of the real economy from around the world. So enjoy. In the wake of COVID, we further recognized that rural households needed access to regular essential services as well as financial security. In order to address this, Frontier Markets partnered with over 10 different companies to introduce hygiene solutions, local groceries, and fintech services at the doorstep of the rural household. What we see is a unique opportunity to take further partnerships to scale. Frontier Markets now more than ever recognizes the value of rural women entrepreneurs, equipping them with the power of technology and leveraging data to help other products and services companies leverage our platform and achieve the sheer impact that we need to, to drive our vulnerable communities out of poverty and create a positive impact. The actual pandemic has blocked the reusable waste material demand in addition to an increase in waste production due to delivery services. We arrange non-contact services, sanitation schedules, and sensitization to reduce the contagion risk. People are now more aware of their own overall waste production, including organics, electronics, and clothing. So it's an opportunity for us to wide our range promote the quality of recycling chain by encouraging responsible consumption and citizens' awareness of their impact on environment. At Farmaline, we combine technology and a network of field agents to help smallholder farmers increase their profits. As an organization, when the first COVID-19 case was recorded in Ghana, we translated WHO COVID awareness messages into seven local languages and sent them as voice messages to over 18,000 farmers. We also use these channels to ensure that our input finance, farmer education and market access services were still in full force. We are actively seeking to partner with the government to use digital platforms to offer training, farm input and market access to more smallholder farmers across the country during and beyond COVID-19. Hi, this is Floriza from Kibebe, Malawi. We make ethical gifts, accessories and home decor at the refugee camp. COVID hit us hard and sales plummeted. We started making cloth masks, which helped somewhat. But in order to really make a difference, 
we see the green innovation being localizing our supply chain. That would mean adding value to the cotton that's grown here and making it into a textile that is good for the environment and can be made by people around us. We recycle plastics to make plastic timbers and other building hardware. Due to COVID-19, we had to close down to respond to government regulations and the World Health Organization. However, we saw a need for personal protective equipment, especially for government frontline workers. And we retooled to manufacture reusable face masks and plastic face shields out of waste. Moving forward, circular businesses are going to be very critical in attaining the UN Agenda 2030 because they put people, profit, and planet at the core of what they do. We all have a role to play in this. That was a wonderful video. Thank you so much, Seed, for taking us across the world to look at some, look at the, how some entrepreneurs are responding to the pandemic with the SDGs as the guiding principles. I'd now like to invite our panelists back. As they turn on their cameras, I would like to introduce them. We have a very distinguished panel with us today. And first up with us, we have Ms. Joyce Masuya, Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environments Program. We have with us Stefan Contius, Commissioner for the 2030 Agenda, Federal Ministry for the Environment, Germany. Sharon Barrow, General Secretary, International Trade Union Confederation. John Dutton, Head of Uplink, Member of Executive Committee at the World Economic Forum. And Louis Akenji, Executive Director at SEED. Wonderful. And we have Louis. Yes, thank you so much, panelists, for joining us here today. I think that we are having a really timely and meaningful discussion here at a very critical point in humanity's history. Um, Stefan, perhaps I can come to you first. Germ Germany has been the strongest voices in the world leading the green recovery conversation. What lessons have we learned from this great lo lockdown that we've seen? Thank you so much. Um, we believe that uh, this pandemic has reminded us how much the economic, environmental and the social dimensions of our societies are interlinked. Pushing the boundaries of the environment, pushing the boundaries of nature can have catastrophic uh, effects. Only an integrated recovery approach can lead to a more resilient future of our societies. Uh, we believe that um, the SDGs are the compass for our way out of the crisis. Uh, they are the basis of a green and inclusive recovery. The implementation of the SDGs increases uh, our resilience and supports the prevention of uh, such effects I just mentioned. And now we have to make sure that the very capital for recovery measures is invested wisely in such a way that respects the environmental boundaries of the planet and at the same time does not hamper economic growth. There are many risks related to high carbon stimulus packages beyond impacting negatively the progress uh, on the 2030 agenda and on the Paris Agreement. They would lead to stranded assets in the long term. This is why the German fiscal package in response to the crisis contains a future investment package that focuses on reducing our carbon footprint and uh, promoting research and development in several key areas including climate friendly mobility and the national hydrogen strategy furthermore as we have recently taken over the eu council presidency one of our priorities will be the implementation of the european green deal um, as this is a growth strategy, 
and at the same time a roadmap to the to the goal of a climate neutral continent by 2050. I very much welcome the new EU industrial policy enhancing circular economy principles and the new EU biodiversity strategy as important components of the European Green Deal and we are very much looking forward to work with our partners worldwide for green recovery programs. Thank you very much Stefan. I'm going to come back to you on some of the points that you've raised but I'd like to invite Joyce now to share her thoughts. What are the impacts on real economy actors here and how can we best address them in this recovery phase? Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. And let me uh, join you in actually thanking uh, our partner SEED in hosting this very timely and exciting uh, event, as well as the government of uh, Germany for supporting the Go SDGs initiative um, that we are working on. So just to get straight into your uh, question, I think one key message is that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually revealed the inherent fragilities in our societies, economies, and relationships with nature. And in addition to fragility, also the interconnectedness of the world. Uh, we've seen how uh, the pandemic from one part of the world has affected the others. Now, the impact of the pandemic is colossal and once in a generation. Uh, dwarfing impact of Great Recession and the largest since uh, the Great Depression. And some of the data that uh, you all are aware of, for example, according to ILO, uh, the pandemic has caused job losses in the range of 300 to 400 million uh, globally. But also we are seeing that uh, the global GDP, according to IMF statistics, will shrink by 5% 2020. So the economic impact is evidently massive. But also COVID-19 is a message for nature. It is a warning that degradation of nature is harming human health. Uh, we do know that uh, COVID-19 might be one of the worst zoonotic diseases, but not the first. Uh, we have seen other uh, outbreaks, for example, Ebola, Rift Valley uh, fever, as well as SARS. And also, as some of you um, noticed, we just launched in UNEP uh, a report on um, uh, zoonotic diseases, which are actually finding there are seven key drivers behind the uh, increased emergence of zoonotic diseases. And I'll just mention a couple. One is the unsustainable agriculture intensification, increased use and exploitation of wildlife, increased travel, transportation, climate change, food supply chains, uh, et cetera. So what we see here in UNEP is that the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement are the, red, are the best roadmaps for actually building back better. They provide real opportunities for collective action towards building back better. Uh, they set the social floors and upper boundaries on what the planet can handle in order to ensure its very basic life support functions and to address the repercussions of the lockdown, such as the dampened demand, the disrupted supply chains, the pressure on companies to cut costs and jobs. We have to keep our focus on real economy actors such as the SMEs. An estimated 2 billion people, two-thirds of the world's employed workforce are in the economy that is dominated by SMEs. So SMEs for, uh, offer real opportunities to actually not only providing the building back better opportunities, but also to make life much better for the people after the pandemic. We are also seeing there is a new wave of sustainability entrepreneurs who are pioneering new markets and shifting consumer preferences. I was delighted to see the video from Seed 
that actually illustrated this point quite um, uh, visibly. So we need to reach them and support them in building back better. Uh, we um, also see that the estimated global market for environmental goods and services is around US dollars 8 trillion per year. But that is only 10% of the global GDP. So there is a potential for future markets for a greener economy, one that the SMEs have a central role to play. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Joyce. I think that you have just shared some really, really um, good insights here as to what we need to do and the severity of the situation before us. You mentioned, you know, job losses of three to four hundred million. And I think this is a good note to turn to Sharon. You know, how are businesses in the real economy creating green jobs? What more is needed? Well, we need a lot more jobs. You know, you're right that uh, indeed Joyce was right that the interconnectedness of this crisis builds on what already existed, which was historic levels of inequality, income inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, and a climate emergency. That means jobs, jobs, and jobs. But at the heart of a uh, crisis management and a recovery that is actually dealing with those things together in a united way. We call it a new social contract. And we believe, as Joyce explained, that the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, this is the roadmap to a new social contract. For us as workers, of course, that is about jobs. 400 million jobs actually have been eviscerated in the last four months. And 1.6 billion of now 2 billion people on our workforce who are working informally, no rights, no uh, uh, minimum wage, no social protection, no rule of law. 1.6 billion are facing destitution because you saw some on the video, but if they don't earn money each day, they don't feed their families. So this recovery must be different. And if we're going to build a new social contract, it can't be just a recovery in the short term. It must be a recovery that brings with it resilience. So we talk about the interconnecting challenges as climate and employment proofing our future. In union terms, it's called Kapow. But in order to look at that, we need to work with the private sector, with the public sector, because both sectors create jobs and both sectors are independent, uh, interdependent. You can't have public health and, uh, and education and childcare and aged care if you don't, in fact, have public uh, investment and management. You can't have those SMEs and uh, the uh, micro businesses that provide the hope of the future, including many of our multinationals as they actually develop without actually the private sector. So we work with both. We believe that we need to put a labour protection floor under all people. We need to actually make sure universal social protection, which is part of resilience for business and for workers, is actually put on the table. And one of our fights right now in that what is around a $10 trillion spend in this crisis is to make sure that we can at least get a global fund for around $35 to $37 billion for the poorest countries. So health and income support are absolutely guaranteed over a five-year period to build, in fact, a basic economy, to sustain those services and to build resilience. But it will take all of us, the private sector, governments, nationalism, internationalism. And I would say that for employers and for ourselves, we've been working very closely together, trying to actually support business continuity, job guarantees, wage guarantees in some of the most vulnerable sectors of our global economy. We've supported and indeed have petitioned the finance ministers of the G20 this week with the IMF and the World Bank and other institutions for debt relief, backing in the um, AU's call for two years of debt relief. But we also want to see a shift in the old thinking about austerity measures as conditions to the SDGs. If governments are financing, investing in their people in alignment with vital sustainable development goals, we're on the path to actually building a, an inclusive future. So it will take all of us, and we are delighted to be uh, working uh, with the, the partners here on this panel, but more broadly, governments, employers, 
and of course uh, um, ourselves as trade unions and civil society. Thank you so much, Sharon. I really like what you said about a new social contract, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I'd like to turn to John. John, the World Economic Forum has been you know, talking a lot about the Great Reset, and I think that that's been really interesting. And from your experience as you have been you know, overseeing the youth initiatives at World Economic Forum, can you share some thoughts on how youth leadership and innovation can help accelerate the circular economy transition and the green recovery that we want to see? Certainly, and thank you for having me with this. As somebody who started their career as an intern at UNEP in Geneva, it's an honor to, to join this panel. Um, listen, young people, innovators, entrepreneurs all over the world are hard at work delivering challenges and solutions related to the circular economy. Here at the forum, we've thought about young people and integrating them into our work for decades. I think what has really changed since I started here in, uh, in the late 2000s was what is your definition of young? I think at, at that time it was kind of under 40. Then we began to start a new community of global shapers that was under 30. And this year in Davos, in fact, we had a series of 15 teenage change makers who came and completely rocked the, the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. And I think one of those highlights was uh, Melody Wilson's accomplishments in reducing ocean plastics. Um, and so we've seen that young people and entrepreneurs can make a major difference. I think on the entrepreneurial side, what we've seen is that the imperative is certainly clear. Uh, what we saw in a, a report that was launched by the forum yesterday, the future of nature and business, is that, um, that we need to have a blueprint. And that report outlined 15 key transitions that would influence the three most impacted systems um, and could, if, if it's implemented with this blueprint, create 10,000 trillion, or sorry, $10 trillion in business value and nearly 400 million jobs. And it's it's really resonates with what both you, Joyce, and Sharon shared around the types of job losses that we have. If we do focus on nature, we can create a similar size uh, amount of job. But I think what we're seeing is that young people and entrepreneurs are developing new technologies. They're finding creative applications and using tools. And at the forum, the, the new initiative that I'm involved in, Blink, is a platform for doing just that. It helps surface and crowdsource both innovative ideas and solutions that we can do to, to actually see them accelerated. Um, and our, our circular economy initiative at the forum uh, that's focused on innovation, Scale 360, is now using this platform, Uplink, to build a community of innovators, investors, government, stakeholders, and businesses that we can with which we can explore circular solutions share the painful roadblocks that we see, but also collaborate on solutions. Um, so we're really excited about the role that young people and entrepreneurs can play in addressing a lot of these challenges uh, and, and looking forward to more of the discussion. Thank you so much, John. I think this is a good place to turn to Lewis. You know, at Seed, I mean, you're all about the entrepreneurs and innovation. So from your perspective, you know, what is the ask from policymakers, if you could you know, request from them something. Uh, what kind of what kind of policy innovation do we need to see? Thank you very much for uh, Jessica for inviting me to speak on this, and thank you very much, partners, for being with us on this journey through the Go for SDGs platform. The video you saw at the beginning of this uh, uh, session is just an indication of the of why SMEs are too essential to be failed in this recovery process and why they are an integral part of it if we're putting people at the center of this recovery. And those SMEs you saw are very typical of the profile of solutions that we engage with around Latin America, Africa, and Asia, trying to find local actions that can be replicated or scaled on the international stage. In fact, Quite a lot of that is captured in uh, one of our more recent reports. I'm just going to put it up here. As you can see from the title, it's about forerunners in advancing the SDGs. It is actually looking at the work CED has been doing over 18 years in all these re regions with eco-inclusive enterprises and asking them, how are they contributing to the environment and to society? And in other words, to the SDGs, but also, what are the challenges that they're facing and how can the international community and governments be of more help? Which goes exactly to the question you asked. Hence the recommendations that I'm going to mention just one or two here that are in the report, but you can find more of it on the website. The very first thing is that governments need to recognize the contributions of SMEs to the SDG objectives, not just as a passing 
uh, as passive stakeholders, but as being integral to it. It means that in planning, implementation, and reporting of the progress of the SDGs, it needs to emphasize the role that these SMEs have played and make them more visible. It also means that successes such as the ones that we've seen a bit earlier today should be used as the evidence base for policy design to make the environment around which these SMEs operate to be more conducive. A second one, of course, is finance. And um, the problem is not that there is necessarily a lack of finance. The, the problem is that the design of these finance mechanisms is not very suitable for the nature of these SMEs, especially in developing countries. So what CEDA has done is it's partnering with uh, banks, insurance companies, other funders, traditional financing uh, institutions, and bringing on board national governments so that collaboratively we can form blended financing mechanisms that uh, help these SMEs lower the risk of investing in them and bring their impacts to scale. There's a lot more on the report that I showed, and I think uh, I can elaborate a little bit more as we progress with the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. That was uh, some really good insights on the SMEs and what help they need. We're going to move into a quick question and uh, answer session. I'd invite our participants online here with us to send your questions into the um, box that's in front of you, and then I would uh, moderate some uh, of the questions that are coming in. So while we wait for these questions, um, I'd like uh, to actually answer to, to ask the panel a question of mine. And we're seeing, you know, reports coming out now that. Uh, you know, countries like China, for example, who have resumed uh, economic activity, the emission levels are going to actually be way higher than pre-COVID levels. So as economies really go back into, I guess, you know, out of their lockdowns and back to economic activity, how can we really make sure that they are putting SDG principles in the 2030 agenda in here? Anyone? I'm happy to have a go. So all sectors have to shift. Every sector of the economy, the trade unions know, have to actually move to a net zero future. It's circular economy, in, in uh, absolutely, but it's also about all sectors doing their bit. For us, that requires just transition. And that's why in our social contract frame, we know that we have to grow jobs. They should be uh, grown from investment in enabling uh, green infrastructure, industry policy, some of the soft infrastructure of care and health and education. But we absolutely know that repair of ecosystems, agricultural shifts, shifts in major manufacturing, those investments, industry policy, will drive jobs and they will drive a net zero future. We can't wait. I heard a young uh, advocate yesterday say, stop talking about uh, walking the talk, start talking about sprinting, because that's where we have to go. So just opening up without recovery plans that are about sustainability and inclusion, jobs focused with the kind of protections we need for people and the environment, that's not going to work. Thank you so much, Sharon. Any of the other speakers want to chime in? All right, we can move on to actually a um, very interesting presentation that the UN Environment Programme has prepared for us, which is the menu of services of the Go for SDGs initiative. And that comes with a whole set of tools um, that people can use to actually implement what we're talking about here. I'd like to introduce now Adriana Zacharias um, from UN UNEP, and uh, she will take us through this. So I would invite the speakers now to turn off your webcam and we'll come back shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, good morning, everybody. A pleasure to be here with you and have the opportunity to present the menu of services for Go for SDGs. As many of you have mentioned, it is time for action or sprinting and also time for cooperation. And this is exactly what Go for SDG wants to do. Next, please. We do not want to reinvent the wheel. We want to build these global initiatives that you have heard at the regional level, increase the uh, implementation of the best practices and develop coherent policies. 
So instead of reinventing the wheel, what we are doing is we are developing, <clears throat> we are bringing together five strategic partners with over 12 different global initiatives. Together, we have developed a very robust menu of services that offers over 120 different tools. These tools will assist governments in mainstreaming sustainable consumption and production and inclusive green economies, <clears throat> providing solutions for climate change, for biodiversity, and in achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As you can see in the screen, we are offering over 30 different expert networks and platforms for advocacy and knowledge. We are offering sectoral assessments for policy design. We have over 40 different training kits to increase capacity development, and we are covering 10 different sectors. Next, please. So who can use these many of services? Our main clients are governments, private sector, in particular SMEs, as some of you have mentioned the, the priority, and youth networks and universities. To make these many of services more attractive and relevant to our actors, we are phrasing it around strategic areas that can help them to build back better. Let me give you an example. For each of the actors, we are providing different toolkits and policy options. We want to assist governments who want to decarbonize economies to find the best fiscal policies for the economic recovery. We want to find and increase the financial mechanisms for sustainable infrastructure or to ensure that we, countries can meet food security through reducing food waste and promoting healthy diets. For each of these areas, we are identifying country champions that are developing best practices, that are mainstreaming SDGs, and we will offer platforms for peer-to-peer -peer learning. We will organize South-South cooperation, and all our partners will be providing capacity development and different tools to scale up these best practices. And the same goes for private sector. We want to assist them and SMEs in increasing innovation, in moving from a linear to a circular economy, as uh, some of you have already mentioned, and in increasing basically practices of sustainable consumption and production, like phasing out plastics. For youth and our universities, our priority is to generate new skills, new jobs, and to empower youth to embrace sustainable living. Next, please. So let me give you a glimpse of how these many of services could look for SMEs. As I mentioned, we have different platforms with knowledge, as the green industry platform, the green finance platform, and as you can see on the screen, the green, green growth knowledge platform that are providing a really interesting and very good ex network of experts that can assist governments and regions in providing tailored solutions. Uh, next uh, click, please. We also have SEED, who is providing, for example, climate finance and is co-creating with SME solutions to scale up innovation. Next click. And um, we have the One Planet Network that with the different programs, like, for example, the program on building um, sustainable building and construction can develop capacity building for zero net buildings. And let's not forget the relevance of the building and construction sector in meeting the climate change um, objectives. Next. So what can we offer for youth and for universities? I think something that um, was a priority, was important in the past, is an urgent priority today in every single region. We need to create new skills for young people and new jobs in every single country. And in that, we are offering the excellent work of PAGE, the Partnership Partnership for Action on Green Economy, who together with ILO and UNDP and other UN agencies have been developing in the last decade green job assessment in different countries, green job trainings, so they can assist that. And what we want is to connect these, the needs for these need jobs for universities so that they can include that in the curricula and provide young people with that. Uh, next click, please. We are also offering, as uh, John has mentioned, the uplink or the scaling um, three, uh, 360, or Lewis have also mentioned. All our partners are empowering young people and entrepreneurs with innovation awards, with competition boot camps. And as you can see in the screen, for example, this is a competition and, uh, that we did in Asia Pacific last year to empower women 
Grow Green Girl, was empowering them to become active and sustainable entrepreneurs. So with this, next please. With this, I, got, I have given you just a little flavor on, on the menu of services for go for sdgs I hope I have got you hungry, that you have some appetite. Our menu is online, as you can see. We do regional and national delivery, and I hope you can join us and let's go for sdgs Thank you very much. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Adriana. That was a really comprehensive and informative overview. I think that takes us very nicely into the second half of our dialogue, where we'll be looking specifically at navigating through this, the sea of options um, for green recovery. Perhaps I can turn to Stefan again to start us off in this second part um, of the conversation. The German ministry is you know, fully behind Go for SDGs. How can platforms like these help to scale action when it comes to post-pandemic recovery? Stefan, I think we need your audio. Crisis cannot be solved uh, by one country or one company or one stakeholder alone. It is important that the international community pulls in the same direction and leverages uh, knowledge as well as expertise that has been accumulated up until now. Many countries face uh, all at once, the difficulties of, on the one hand, uh, fighting the crisis and trying to support their economies, and on the other hand, complying with the international milestone agreements, such as the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Government and companies need to make rapid decisions. We should therefore leverage examples of excellence and replicate them worldwide. It is about uh, scaling up positive experiences. Go for SDGs uh, will work for the acceleration of action. I am grateful to the World Economic Forum, the International Trade Union Confederation, to PAGE and to SEED, but they are supporting this effort, which is led by UNEP. We very much hope that the tailor-made advice to key actors in developing countries will very much contribute to improvements which will make the difference. We have to act now. Thank you so much, Stefan. I think what you said there about tailor-made advice is really useful, especially um, you know, for such a large swathe of the economy with different needs. I think that is super crucial. Um, John, I'd like to come back to you a little bit more. I think what you shared about Uplink is really interesting. Um, given this pandemic, I mean, have you seen the interest in Uplink being sustained? And how is Uplink fostering new startups and job creation even as we go through this pandemic? Thanks, Jessica. And I, I mean, I would come back to what you said, Stefan. We all need to be heading in the right direction and heading there together. Uh, certainly, the startups and SMEs have been disproportionately impacted by, by the COVID crisis. We set off in 2020 launching Uplink as a, a platform that really could empower anyone anywhere with an idea and solution uh, that, that wanted to address one of the SDGs. What we've seen as we've gone through the COVID crisis, however, is that that's not enough. Uh, we need to be focusing also on how can we surface and, see, and seek the solutions and ideas from people that aren't represented in, in the appropriate way, from geographies, sectors, uh, and, and backgrounds that, that don't have the access to the right type of impact ecosystem. In the post-COVID world, I think we've seen that digital and virtual is more important than ever. I think we're all seeing that our organizations are, are, impacting, are being impacted by, by this crisis. But I think more importantly that it is actually democratizing in some ways the, the way in which people can offer that up. And Uplink has, has seen that uh, experience over the last few months. We, we, we're really early in our, our, our uh, mission here, but it, so far we've been extremely pleased with how it's gone. The Ocean Solution Sprint was our first pilot. And through that, we were able to source about 50 different solutions. Uh, the, the winners, actually, two of the three winners came from the developing uh, economies, one from Myanmar, one from Pakistan, that were doing amazing entrepreneurial endeavors. And that's, that's continued. We now have launched a COVID challenge that is looking at not just this 
you know, how do we build back better, but also looking at to how can we prevent and detect the next crises and how can we recover and, and deliver the responses that we need. I think importantly for this discussion also in the circular economy and then in the space of the environment, we're now in the process of a, a, a trillion trees challenge, part of our collaboration with uh, the one, one .org, um to see how over the coming years, we can get startups and SMEs to actually be a part of this ecosystem and seek nature-based solutions that are driven by entrepreneurs. Um, one of the ones that I think sets this up as a, as a nice example has come through just in the last couple of weeks and has responded to our challenge on recovery and rebuild. It's called Inveritas. And it has developed cheaper, more accurate ways to conduct randomized sampling at the national scale for lower middle income countries. And it's actually already being launched in Ethiopia and Brazil. And so we're, we're seeing that there are these startups, these small companies that can deliver huge impact for economies and countries that need a different type of response. Uh, we're really excited about it. And I guess I'd just close this portion about Uplink as a service for, for this initiative to say, uh, we'd really invite you to get on and uh, sign up as a member. Uh, many of you may have uh, solutions that you could sub, uh, suggest to, to, to be submitted or that you have networks that you can share this in. So we're excited to see, hopefully out of this, we'll have hundreds of new users and, and a lot of uh, partnerships that we can help build uh, this, this nature economy that does, I think, leverage our startups and SMEs around the world. Thank you so much, John. I think that was really interesting to hear what Uplink is doing in terms of job creation for the youth. Um, and still staying on the topic of jobs, I'd like to turn to Sharon. I mean, job creation is clearly a big part of the green recovery. So what role is ITUC playing? I mean, you're such a big global organization. How are you, um, you know, reaching out to all the countries and how does a platform like Go for SDGs help you? So the SDG platform is critical because first of all, it integrates the challenge of a, uh, a net zero future with in fact, the goal eight, which is decent work, goal one, which has social protection, goal three and four, our public, vital public services, health and education, and of course, equality, goal five and many others. But if you have a flaw of decent work and it's in a sustainable frame, then we can actually build the future that is inclusive for everybody. Or the way we describe it is aligning people and the planet with economy. But it will take a very different mindset. And I've been really heartened by this panel. I want to reiterate the fact that we can't solve this nation by nation. We can grow jobs nation by nation, although if we're to have inclusive development, it will require global solidarity. But we can't do that and uh, ignore the reality that you can't solve the climate emergency unless there's global cooperation. And so we need people to take seriously the shift in every sector, the due diligence around, of course, we would say, uh, you know, uh, not just finance, but uh, rights and environment and the risk of, uh, you know, exploitation on both those fronts. But we need to do that with a consciousness that that also involves small to medium enterprise, it involves policy that must be national and global. And in terms of where we see hope, the cities are fundamental for everybody because if you're actually housing seven to nine billion people on the planet in cities then they have to be livable they have to have a circular economic base and they have to actually be the places that while they drive jobs within the cities the demand and supply that's conditional on some of those challenges around both jobs and uh, climate is actually supporting the, uh, the supply uh, um, um, communities, whether they're national or indeed global. And we're going to see a lot of shift in the way the global economy and production and transport is generated. So for us, it's absolutely about where's the sharing of wealth, where's the shared prosperity, where's the shared ambition, how does every country do their piece, and how in fact do you make sure that you're not leaving people behind, not, no stranded workers, no stranded communities, no nations this time, simply out of uh, a future of hope 
and uh, with the kind of democratic rights and freedoms that make for an inclusive future. So recovery and resilience is fundamental and it's all about aligning people and the planet with economy. And that will mean we all have to take responsibility for shifting the scenario. But unless we can repair our broken multilateralism, unless we can get global cooperation, not just on funding, but in sharing of technology, on the kind of uh, conditionality that must be a level playing field for environment and rights around trade, we will fail. So people have to speak up. This is a future, a moment where we can build a future if we choose to be uh, united around a much uh, more healthy and sustainable and indeed, uh, you know, uh, um, um, security in terms of, and build security in terms of jobs and social protection. So this is so integrated now and this panel makes so much sense. So let's uh, keep the good work going and congratulations UNEP and the German government for bringing us together. Thank you so much, Sharon, for those inspiring comments. I think, you know, you've really kind of uh, given voice to that that hope that we want to see this broken multilateralism recovered, you know, that everybody, the global community will come back together. I'm um, just turning to Lewis now. I mean, we've heard from, you know, the other speakers on, on, on jobs and, and entrepreneurship. What role can, you know, SMEs and I guess your seed champions, the, the companies that you fund, play in fostering and sustaining greener recoveries? I think we got a glimpse from that video, but do you have some more practical examples you can share with us? Oh, there is lots that we can share with you. Uh, by the way, I agree very much with Sharon and the statement she just made about social protections. And the, the reason why this is uh, strongly related to SMEs is because we really think it's a missed opportunity when SMEs, especially eco-inclusive SMEs, are seen, not, are seen just as for-profit businesses rather than for the quality that they bring to the communities in which they invest, rather than the jobs that they create, rather than their, their contributions in solving environmental uh, problems. So seeing them as government partners in addressing social and environmental objectives is really the perception of SMEs that we would like to drive. After all, SDG2, more than 50% of enterprises we work with are in, engaged in sustainable agriculture. SDG5, about 50 something percent of SMEs that we work with are actually founded by women. And in over 60% of these cases, the gender equality in wages is actually there. So there's a lot of examples of how they're employing marginalized people, they're addressing waste management issues at very local levels in ways that are not usually very visible on, on, on large screens. And we intend to bring this up uh, to, to public view and to the view of government. One of the things we're doing about this is providing localized and high impact capacity development. Thanks to the government of Germany, the government of Flanders, the EU and so on that have been supporting us for this. And we're building local support institutions that offer incubation and acceleration services to SMEs in achieving the SDGs. At the same time, we're beginning to encourage governments to foster innov uh, innovative low threshold certification programs that higher the visibility of, of uh, eco-inclusive SMEs so that they can actually use it as uh, use it and the, uh, the impacts that they are creating as part of the justification for why they need to be scaled. So a lot of support is needed here, especially in strengthening the SDGs. If we want to see communities stronger, if we want to see stronger social protection, if we want to see more resilient uh, businesses coming up. Thank you so much, Louis. I think you take us very nicely into Joyce. And uh, you know, I'd like to invite you now to share, you know, how can platforms like for SDG support that green recovery efforts? Um, do you see any trade-offs happening here? Thank you, Jessica. So uh, Go SDGs is a very good example of how the United Nations, together with our partners, can actually scale the impact uh, is part of the decade of action on sustainable development goals. Uh, Go SDGs can actually, as we've heard from uh, the other panelists, can accelerate and raise the ambition for greening recoveries. How can this platform do that? By picking examples, good examples from individual countries and sharing and replicating them through partner networks. Other panelists spoke about customization of examples from one context to another. Let me just pick one example from uh, Adriana's presentation. 
uh, as a case in point, the goal for SDG support to SMEs. I think this clearly highlights um, how secular SMEs, startups are actually key to transition towards a more sustainable and secular uh, value chains. Think about the post-COVID pandemic context and how the circular business models will be absolutely central to strengthen resilience, enhance value creation potential, and build back better. I want to give you a very specific example from Ghana, uh, Ghana Bamboo Bikes, which actually empowers a very poor population in rural areas with technology that they need to make durable bikes which can be modified, maintained, and even repaired locally. The, 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 the project not only creates jobs, but also addresses mobility and innovation around nature-based solutions as well as materials. So do I think there is trade-off? No, there is no trade-off between recovery efforts and uh, th that restore jobs and enhance release resilience of nature. We're already seeing a number of countries, regions that are hardwiring into their response efforts that create employment as well as restore nature. Let me give you two examples. Uh, Europe has created a next generation EU recovery plan valued at 750 billion euros over the next four years that aims to kickstart job creation through building retrofits, e-mobility, and agricultural reforms from, fac, from farm to fork. Another example is from Panama. Ministry of Finance announced a US dollar 2.5 billion opportunity bank program whereby SMEs will have access to 64 months loans aimed at sectors that include commerce, crafts, as well as agribusiness. So the important here is that the challenge of meeting the 2030 agenda is too large to do alone. We need global solidarity, as we have heard, to work together if we are going to reach the SDGs and Paris Agreement. In other words, we need to go together to go for SDGs. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Joyce. You've put it so eloquently. Um, just looking at the questions now that have been coming in, I think there's this one very interesting question that touches on what you have talked about, Joyce, on trade-offs. And it's a question from India here, from someone called Sharia. And basically, um, this person saying to reduce poverty in India, there will be high demand for electrification. And of course, when the demand for electricity increases, then go 13, climate change gets affected. And so you can see that there's a little bit of a trade off between these two goals. So how do you as a company or organization look at the trade offs or the conflicts of the SDGs in your decision making? And if you're a policymaker, how do you address this? Any one of you want to take this? I come in uh, from Berlin. We believe that uh, uh, the renewable energies offer a very good example of how you can combine uh, sustainable development policies with uh, reaching out to poor areas in a large country. Uh, it is uh, a very effective means uh, to have clean energy, sustainable energy, and in the same time, uh, helping uh, people living in areas where there is no electricity yet. And this applies, of course, even more so in big cities uh, where we believe um, we could have more uh, use of renewables uh, than we see it today. Many countries are very much moving into this direction, and this is very encouraging. Uh, but um, we have to scale up, as we said, and we will. Wonderful, Stefan. Jessica, maybe quickly on our side, you know, we I think this is a good example of where uh, the innovation is going to drive this change. If there are, you know, it's very easy perhaps for me sitting in Geneva to think about renewable energy, but if there are technologies and innovation on the ground in places like India that are allowing people to have, you know, more accessible, cheaper solar energy, 
uh, or uh, wind energy or other renewable energy. It's going to be it's going to go a long way in trying to address that. Uh, we're partnering with great uh, organizations like Mission Innovation uh, at the forum uh, to think through how, how can we help with that energy transition that's taking place. But I think it's it's not it's going to be uh, it's going to take a lot of creative uh, financing of those type of activities, but also innovation that we're looking to support to get there. Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? I, uh, uh, Sharon, do you want to go, please? My problem. Sharon, I think your audio is uh, turned off. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I was just going to contribute uh, one example. You know, we have around 40 billion, uh, 40 trillion uh, dollars invested in the global economy. It's workers' capital or their pension funds, and you know, many of our pension funds are already funding. Uh, renewable energy. Our Danish pension funds, for example, are uh, particularly committed to this because Denmark is a centre for wind technology, as all of you would know. And they are funding ventures in other countries with employers, big firms, European firms, but uh, American firms, others, to build wind energy. And that's just one example. So we want to see a model of financing that does three things. One, it actually is invested in that transition and that the transition's just because these kind of projects with our money bring with them a commitment by the companies to, uh, you know, fundamental rights, to uh, prevailing wages, to, you know, working with unions in social dialogue. And in addition to that, of course, what we want to see is that that when married with government uh, incentives for funding or uh, IFI funding in terms of the multilateral development banks, that there's a more patient approach to debt. We have to do this anyway to come out of the recovery. If we're not investing in a medium to long term um, future with a medium to long term outlook on debt repayment, we're not going to transform the uh, the future as we've all described. And I compliment the EU for opening up that window in their recovery plans, being driven, of course, uh, you know, by countries like Germany. So thank, thank you again for hosting this, but let's say that this is a piece we can continue to work on. How do you take the best of technology in renewable energy, the best of technology in transitioning all major industry and share it globally? Fantastic. Thank you, Sharon. Louis, you wanted to chime in? I thought the question from India was a very interesting one that shows the complexity of the package that we're dealing with, the, uh, the SDGs in this case, that we still have uh, millions of people that we have to get out of poverty. And at the same time, we're talking about overall reductions in global consumption. But it, it also shows that some of the thinking that we, we have in approaching this problem needs to uh, change. We typically think of energy in terms of large scale infrastructure that gets uh, distributed from a central location across uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of kilometers. But what we're seeing with enterprises we're working with is creativity from rural areas uh, combined with application of low energy technology. So uh, about 30% of uh, uh, enterprises that we work with actually use solar uh, uh, energy for water, water purification and, and water pumps. And we have about more than 50% of uh, uh, the enterprises that we're working with supplying renewable energy from renewable sources. What this is telling is, if you can start thinking of decentralized solutions, if you can start thinking of solutions that are necessarily more embedded at a local level, it doesn't only provide energy and get people out of poverty, it starts allowing people, the agency, to find solutions towards uh, that address the other SDGs that we are talking about. So I, I think, yes, there is a challenge there, but there, there, there are already sort of roots that allow us to grow better solutions than the ones that we find today. Thank you so much, Lewis. I think that was really interesting what you raised. Um, this question of balance is coming out a lot. We have a question here uh, from someone called Philip. How can job creation be balanced with the rise of consumption? I guess this is assuming that, you know, the more jobs are created, I suppose the consumption rises. Does anyone have a, a view on that? Well, well, I'm happy to have a go. It doesn't, uh, it's, it's not about consumption per se. We have planetary boundaries, of course, and that 
they have to be lived within. But the question from India is right. You know, the developed world can't tell the developing world they can't have a standard of living that enables people to uh, live and work in dignity. So the circular economy and making sure that we reuse or redeploy our resources makes it possible for people to share prosperity and share, you know, more uh, um, uh, dignified consumption in a way that doesn't deny people living standards or jobs. We have to, to create that future and that means redesigning the economic base where full employment, decent work and shared prosperity is at the heart. And that's for us the, the core of a new social contract. Thank you so much, Sharon. I think that's very well said. We have an interesting question here from Joshua, who is, um, you know, observing that, uh, you know, countries like Germany is, you know, leading the charge on, on building back better. And of course, different countries are at different stages. But what can the individual do? What can we do on a very local level to contribute to this uh, recovery? I think there are many ways to do this. Uh, for instance, uh, do you use uh, public transport or a bicycle or do you uh, really need to go by car? In some cases, uh, people cannot do it without uh, uh, using a car. But in many cases, we have the opportunity. And by the way, um, this is something people in OECD countries uh, sometimes forget. Um, there is not just uh, uh, the alternative between different modes of transport using certain techniques, uh, walking is still an option and it's very healthy. But this is something which is very much known to our friends uh, in developing countries, so I will not mention this uh, further. The main thing is that um, we simply think about what we need, what we can repair uh, without buying new. So just to, to think a little bit what might be reasonable and this has a huge impact uh, also of course um, the way we choose our food products uh, we all know that the climate impact of uh, certain products is very different from others and again um, it is about uh, certainly um, those better off in all of our societies worldwide uh, who have to make the biggest step. Um, uh, when we remember the tales of our grandparents, uh, they didn't eat as much meat as, as many people do today. It's a long story, but it's a very, how should I say, day-to-day -day, uh, decision to improve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I'm just going to move into the next question with an eye on the time. It's an interesting one um, from someone called Mark. Any ideas on how to approach vested interests that do not want to shift to a circular economy? I think this is great because, I mean, not just the circular economy, but the shift, the energy transition, there's a lot of vested interest there as well. So how do we overcome the inertia and the, the, the existing structures? John, can I come to you? At Web, you must come across, you know, this question quite a lot. I mean, listen, I think, you know, we definitely we're bringing together the, across the the board the different the different players. We recently held a uh, a virtual industry transition day, and it's part of our, what we're calling Mission Possible, uh, to state that actually it is possible for us to make big transitions in some of these industries. But I think it takes a multitude of of, of perspectives to get across the board. You're going to have to have government intervention with some some policy inter, you know, aspects to it, but also investment from financing, like Sharon um, alluded to, and to show that it, you know, you can um, have some of these environmental and circular outcomes while also succeeding in business. Um, and that's some, of, you know, just three of the ways in which I think we're trying to do that. But it is really about bringing those stakeholders together. I think if, if we're not, you're, we're going to have um, you know, different sides a bit pointing the finger to one another and saying that they need to act first. Um, so that's, that's been very much our approach at the forum is to uh, be able to, to kind of do some of that, sometimes behind closed doors, sometimes uh, like we had with this industry transition day, 180,000 people tuned in to learn about it. So um, I, I think it'll take a, co a, co a combination of things, Jessica, to get that uh, accomplished. 
but Thank I you, think if we, but I think if we're really sprinting, then while obviously you have to show people and give people confidence and hope for the future, we're going to need regulation. And it comes back to Stefan's point about the fact that we need global coherence because we're talking about whether or not we have a planet on which we can live and we can, uh, you know, uh, provide some hope for future generations. This is not a climate emergency that's about the environment when it boils down to it. It, of course, is environmentally uh, generated, but this is a climate emergency that's about the very extinction of human beings. So, you know, waiting for people to accept change in some ways is just not going to be possible in many, many areas. And we're all going to have to accept that. But that's why we talk about just transition. So you include people, you negotiate with them. And in fact, because Germany's hosting this, the German government did uh, what everybody said was impossible. Others have too, but Germany sat with trade unions, with uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry, particularly coal, and they negotiated a future and how we get there. I live in Belgium as my, uh, you know, uh, um, adoptee country of the moment, and they've set regulations over time, but not too much time. Within 10 years, all buildings will have to meet certain regulation. It's forcing us who own a building to actually look at uh, what that means in terms of what steps we have to take. So regulation, responsibility, let's get the roadmap, build the trust, but let's make it happen quickly. Fantastic. And the same Sharon. applies also, if I may come in, uh, the same applies also to fiscal policies. Uh, we have now yes. several requests uh, sitting on the desk of the United Nations-led Alliance page uh, of countries who want to have uh, advice how to best build their fiscal system in a way which is better for jobs, which is better for uh, sustainable products, etc. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm just going to come to the uh, wrap up of the panel as I've got an eye on the time. And I just want to summarize some of the key points that we've made here, which has been really, really interesting. I think we've talked about the importance of resilience in this uh, post pandemic recovery. We've talked about the go for SDGs menu, uh, the options that are available to us. And we've talked about the importance of youth, innovation, leadership, SMEs. And I think, you know, it's such an interesting conversation. So obviously we can't cover everything today, but as a kind of a wrap up, can I just invite the, the speakers here today to kind of share this one take away that you have for the you know the audience that's with us the participants today if they have to go away and think about what does a green recovery look like what is that one thing they should take away with them Lewis can I invite you first uh, yes when when I uh, the, the word recovery is actually maybe a, a code word for a test of our resilience as a society of, of the social infrastructures that we've created of the physical platforms that we have that allow us to engage in society. And what, what this pandemic has done is actually questioned whether we have in place the right ones. And this is when I go back and I say, small is beautiful. Small is also essential. So what we need more and more is not just small and medium-sized enterprises in this case, but also small actions at a very localized level where people feel a sense of strong ownership where people also feel like they belong to a larger whole. In this case, I think the essence of global collaboration in building a, a, a joint recovery is to strengthen local resilience. There's no better way of strengthening local resilience than looking at small and medium-sized enterprises that are there, than looking at uh, actions of uh, local communities that are there. And by looking at intermediaries that are facilitating the search, not only for environmental solutions, but also social solutions. So I would say, look out for champions of SDGs because that is what SEED is going to be bringing to you. Thank you very much, Lewis. Move on to John. Uh, audio? Apologies. L Lewis, that really resonates with me. I, I, I was uh, smiling because I, I think some of my takeaways are similar. It's, it's about empowering young people and, and entrepreneurs that, that you have a voice and that the more you can make your voice heard, the more that governments are going to feel empowered to put in some of these regulations to to make a difference in, in the circular space you have a, an opportunity to, to to influence policymakers you have an opportunity to change consumption patterns that are going to influence private sector 
and you can actually do things. You, there's platforms uh, like the the Go4 SDGs that is is taking off to to support your actions. Uplink is excited to be part of that ecosystem. Um, and I guess that would be my message. You you can do something about uh, creating the change you want to see happen. Thank you very much, John. Can I invite Sharon to share your thoughts? So I think, you know, business as usual is simply not acceptable. We all agree with that. And if you are going to look at recovery, that's not enough either. We're still in a crisis phase. We could be facing a depression that's three times as great as the 1930s. Let's hope not. But we're already seeing the signs. We know that we're going to coexist with this virus and try to build a recovery at the same time. But if we don't build resilience, and if that resilience is not both about people and the planet, then we will simply uh, go on as usual. So massive systems change is required. Everybody has to find a future in this, but it means we have to climate and employment proof our world. It's that simple and we cannot be tinkering at the edges. This takes redesign, integrated commitment and indeed uh, a coherence and a governance that we have to dare to dream and put in place. Thank you, Sharon. I'll come to Stefan now. Yeah, we believe that uh, we need this wide range of actors which somehow became visible today. It is about the worker uh, looking for a good job which has the potential to be employed at, uh, not just for today but also for longer. It is about uh, the mother uh, who sometimes uh, cannot uh, say that she is empowered for, for what she wants to do. It is about girls who do not get the, the education uh, they need. It's about entrepreneurs not knowing uh, that there are avenues to be better. And there are so many others uh, and organizations who can show the way out of uh, certain calamities. We have uh, the request in several countries of very energy intense uh, industry areas to their governments that they should act faster. So you see there is a fundamental shift from the problem to the request to go for solutions. And I think this is what we talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. And last but certainly not least, Joyce, I think it's perfect that you're going to wrap up the session with your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Everything that uh, has been said uh, right now resonates. I think uh, two messages uh, from UNEP. One is as the trillions of recovery packages being put together, let's work together to re to direct them to help the greening of the real economy but also creating jobs preferably green jobs the second message is please join us in unep and our partners on the journey to go for sdgs it needs collective action over to you jessica Thank you so much, Joyce. I have to say that's a really inspiring slogan for myself. You know, Singapore has just finished an elections and the core of the message was jobs, but I did not hear any one of our ministers talking about the SDGs. So I'm going to send them the Go for SDGs uh, website and make sure they look at it. Um, thank you so much, speakers, for such a wonderful and insightful discussion. I think, you know, we've learned so much. I've learned so much. Um, and that's all the time we have for. And I know that this conversation is going to go beyond just the hour and the bit that we've spent here. So I want to thank everyone for being part of this event, um, to see, to UNET for hosting, to all our participants who are here for us. Um, and I just want to say, remember that the 20... 2030 agenda is our pathway to recovery. So I encourage everybody to go and explore this wonderful platform that UNEP has built. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you.